Hello, I'm Richard Young, your host with Facundo Batista and Kaylin Overholt for MIT's course on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and the pandemic. The purpose of this course is to learn what we know today about COVID-19 pandemic from the world's top scientists. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to one of the world's most talented immunologists, Professor Shiv Palai. Dr. Palai studied medicine and completed his PhD in India, and as a young postdoc, joined the laboratory of David Baltimore at my institution, Whitehead Institute. Over the course of his career, he's made many important scientific contributions to immunology. As a result of this, Dr. Palai is a professor of medicine, health sciences, and technology at Harvard Medical School. He's also a core member at the Reagan Institute, where he runs an NIH-funded Center of Excellence in Autoimmune Disease. For me, what makes Shiv so distinct is his passion for teaching and mentoring young scientists, which he has done for many years. And as a consequence, he's been the recipient of many teaching awards. Shiv's research is focused on the various immune cells that respond to infection, including infection by SARS-CoV-2. I'll remind you when Dr. Palai's talk is over that uh, we welcome questions, which I will give him for you. Shiv, thank you for bringing our understanding of the cells targeted by this virus and the immune response to it to our students and viewers. So, so Rick and Fukundo, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be teaching in your course. So the story of COVID-19 is a story steeped in tragedy uh, and tempered by some remarkable scientific advances. Most of the deaths happening today in our part of the world are unfortunately the result of scientific misinformation. And elsewhere, these are happening as a result of inequities in the distribution of healthcare. Uh, but every death is a tragedy. And I want to start by acknowledging that we who study this disease are benefiting from those who suffer from it, at least benefiting intellectually, and those who have unfortunately passed away. So I'm gonna start with a small tribute to them, and I call it the center did not hold. Immune cells, they tell their stories through signaling cascades. Their tales are never one-sided a fine balance pervades. What goes up, it has been said, must someday come down. Moderation is the key. There's no need to go to town. Our immune systems, they were naked, faced a foe they had never seen. No antibodies then in any human to the COVID spike protein. An immune system that is balanced, that generally is the norm. But sometimes immunity goes berserk and the virus starts a storm. Remember William Butler Yeats, but things don't always fall apart. It's when that fine balance is lost that signals go off the chart. Uncontrolled gene expression, or a failure of inhibition, and the immune system loses its exquisite precision. That balance, it is crucial. Homeostasis, if you please. The loss of immune precision is the basis of disease. Yeats said things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Dysregulated COVID immunity has sadly culled the old. So I'm going to start by, uh, once I share my screen, I'm just going to start by giving you a big, broad overview of some of the points we're going to touch on in this lecture. And uh, the first thing is that it is immune activation that drives COVID-19, the disease. Uh, the virus can evade something we're going to call the antiviral state. Uh, the virus also activates inflammation, unwanted inflammation in this case. 
So uh, innate defects enhance susceptibility to severe COVID-19. The innate imbalance in severe COVID-19 creates suboptimal adaptive immunity, both for antibodies and for T cell responses. And we'll discuss this, at least in severe disease, we see something that tells us that perhaps suboptimal adaptive immunity might lead to viral persistence and the evolution of viral variants. And in many patients who survive severe COVID-19, the adaptive immune system response recovers and it gains immunological breadth, but this happens later in the disease, okay? So I'm going to my next slide. Sorry, I have just, okay. Can you still see my slides? Fine. So this is just a view of the virus. And this is the virus with the spike protein. It's an artistic rendition of how the spike protein actually breeds on the surface. Here's a view of the spike protein with, this is a trimer. And one third of the trimer now has the RBD domain standing up, binding to its receptor, which is ACE2. Uh, ACE2 recognizes the spike protein and a protease cleaves the spike protein, as you've heard in previous lectures. But we worry today about the Lambda variant, which is not just antigenically altered, but which also has a mutation that allows uh, in the spike protein that allows easier cleavage at the site. And this is one of the reasons why this is so dangerous. Uh, once this fusion protein, or this fusion peptide is revealed, it inserts itself into the host membrane and you have a fusion of the viral envelope with the host membrane and delivery of the viral contents, the nucleic acid into the cytosol. The other point that you all should probably know by now is that the goal is to have antibodies that will block the virus from binding S2 and that's called neutralization and you will discuss that later in this course as well. Now, if you looked at COVID-19 and you think about the lungs, in the healthy lungs, we have air in our alveoli. And we're looking here at what the healthy lung looks like if you looked at a section of the lung, okay? And what happens in COVID-19 is that it is the immune system that makes the lung dysfunctional. You see here that you have this diseased lung in COVID-19. You have a lot of inflamed cells, in, inflammatory cells, in the lung, we have blood clots, you have damage to tissues, and this is all a result of immune activation. Fluid collects in the alveoli so the patient cannot breathe. And so this is basically what's happening in COVID-19. The immune response, which is aberrant and out of control, is now causing the lungs to be dysfunctional. Okay? So again, just to point this out, what is inflammation? If you looked at a normal heart, this is what it would look like. If you saw somebody with a myocardial infarction, there are immune cells, inflammatory cells that have invaded the heart tissue. Similarly, if you have a normal lung, it looks beautiful with nice air-filled spaces. And then in an infected lung, you now have cells and fluid filling up the alveoli and you don't have lung function. And this is actually a pneumonia, just shown as an example. So when we think of the immune system, we break it up into innate immunity, which occurs rapidly and adaptive immunity, which takes a little more time. And innate immunity, there are two major components. We deal with viruses by making certain cytokines that we call type one and type three interferons. And we also use cells like NK cells to kill virally infected cells. We, the other half of innate immunity, which is not dealing directly with viruses, but might be activated, involves sentinel cells and phagocytes, and these can drive inflammation. Okay. Now, adaptive immunity is made up of B cells, which will eventually make antibodies, and T cells where the function in this disease would be for cytotoxic T cells to kill infected cells, virally infected cells. Now, what we're going to see, innate immunity is broken into inflammation and the antiviral state in a broad sense. And what happens in COVID is that inflammation is out of control. You don't want it, but we have it, uh, and we have it in spades. And the antiviral state, which we would like to have had, is largely evaded by this virus. Okay. So again, what you would see in COVID is that there'll be a lot of cells, the cells here called myeloid cells, many of them are driving inflammation. So we will see activated neutrophils and large numbers of them, activated macrophages, large numbers of them. You'll see uh, monocytes, which are cells that can become macrophages, highly activated. 
And not only are they, are they activated, they activated in a dysfunctional manner. So the monocytes, if you look at their transcriptome, this looks a lot like what you would see in sepsis on patients with a stroke. So this is dysfunctional monocytes, all happening with an increase in numbers and also an alteration in functionality, making them more inflammatory. At the same time, some of the cells that would protect us from viruses, like NK cells, they do not increase in numbers. If anything, they decline. Plasma cytodendritic cells, cells that help make type 1 interferons, decline. And certain innate lymphoid cells, which also protect us against, some of them protect us against viruses, they also decline. Okay? So if you looked in a COVID lung, we see a lot of neutrophils, and the staining here is for a function of neutrophils, which occurs after they're activated, when they release their DNA and their granule contents and they trap microbes, and this is a sign of severe activation. And we look at citrullinated histone H3 in neutrophils to actually see whether we have netosis. This process of netosis is when neutrophils release their DNA and form traps. And there's a lot of netosis. And when you look at macrophages, looking in the lung here, uh, the macrophages, almost every macrophage stained here with CD68 also has activation of a mini organelle called the inflammasome, which is part of inflammation and which is driving the processing and secretion of IL-1, okay? So we have a lot of activation of inflammatory cells in the lung in severe COVID-19. When we think about the innate immune response, we can think of it as being branched into two transcriptional events. A sensor, recognize something that's foreign, called a PAMP for a pathogen associated molecular pattern, or a DAMP, which is a damaged associated molecular pattern. And the sensor can activate a transcription factor called NF-kappa B1, and NF-kappa NF -kappa B can drive inflammation. It induces pro-inflammatory cytokines, among other things. Sensors can also induce the phosphorylation of two transcription factors, IRF3 and IRF7, which can drive the synthesis of type 1 interferons. So we can have an innate cell activated by something from a pathogen induce both the inflammatory cytokines and the antiviral state cytokines, often simultaneously. Now, when you think of what these sensors are, there are some sensors on the cell surface. Uh, some of them are toll-like receptors. We have sensors in endosomes, which are also toll-like receptors. But these ones basically see nucleic acids. The sensors on the outside often see bacterial products. We also have sensors in the cytosol, and I'm going to stress the rig-like receptors, which can see viral RNA, double-stranded viral RNA in the cytosol. And double-stranded viral RNA is a feature of all viruses in their life cycles. Whether they are DNA viruses or RNA viruses, we will have double-stranded RNA as part of the life cycle. So again, TLRs in the endosomes in certain cells like plasma, cytoid, dendritic cells make extremely high amounts of type 1 interferons, okay? So there are TLRs that see different nucleic acids and they are in endosomes. So the sensors for RNA, RIG-I and MDA5, are geared to seeing viral RNAs. They're looking for short viral double-stranded RNAs and they're looking for them to be uncapped or they're looking for them to lack a particular structure of the cap, even if they have part of the cap on. So RIGI sees short viral double-stranded RNAs, and it likes them to have no cap on them, whereas the uh, MDA5 can, you can have a cap, but as long as there isn't a modification called cap1, this sensor can see those RNAs. Now, what do the type 1 interferons do when they are made? These type 1 interferons released by cells which are activated through sensors, which could be nucleic acid sensors, will now go and bathe neighboring cells. They will activate the type 1 interferon receptor on neighboring cells. And in those cells, they will turn on various enzymes and other proteins, which will help create an antiviral state, which will protect that cell from being infected by viruses. Now, why does our own messenger RNA not turn on viral sensors? Obviously, we've evolved messenger RNAs not to turn on our viral sensors. So just to remind you that, you know, we have our own messenger RNA sitting in the cytosol, and we have to worry about what is it that makes these sensors get turned on. 
So when you think about our own RNAs, we have a seven methyl guanosine cap. And part of the cap, we have a structure, it's called cap one, where the first ribose and the first uh, ribose of the first uh, nucleotide base complex, the uh, first nucleotide is gonna be modified by an enzyme that will methylate the two prime hydroxyl group of the ribose, okay? So now what's gonna happen is here we have, here's the first base over here. This ribose is gonna be modified on the O here, the second hydroxyl group, and it's gonna be methylated normally. And we're gonna add the seven methyl guanosine cap with the triphosphate. And this is normally what we do for our messenger RNAs. And then SARS-CoV-2 is pretty smart. It's so our sensors, you know, are, can be activated only if we don't have a normal messenger RNA and we have uh, no uh, cap structure. And but 10 of the 29 genes of SARS-CoV-2 contribute to preventing the induction of type 1 interferons in infected cells. And some of these genes are just shown here. When you think now of this cap structure, and we said there's a 7 methyl guanosine cap, there's an enzyme in SARS CoV 2 which can make, help make the cap and methylate it. There's an enzyme in SARS CoV 2 can add this methyl group to the 2 prime hydroxy group of the ribose. So this is the first normal base of the RNA. And this is what is causing these viral RNAs to evade some of our own cytosolic sensors, okay? Another trick that the virus uses is to make these little vesicles out of the ER. And this is used by all coronaviruses actually. And the virus is gonna replicate within these vesicles so that the RNA is hidden from the sensors while it's replicating. Then the virus uses one of its proteins, it's called NSP3 to make a pore, this beautiful pore, a machine to allow those viral RNAs to come out in order to assemble new virus so that it's hidden during replication. And then as they come out, they're not available to sensors because of other mechanisms. And then they come out and are now created, you're creating new viral particles, okay? Another protein in the virus actually goes and sits in the, the groove of the ribosome, preventing our own RNAs from binding, our messenger RNAs to bind to the groove, but allowing viral messenger RNAs to come into the groove. And so we are gonna have preferential viral RNAs being translated and host messenger RNAs are not being translated. And this is another way in which the virus tries to help evade us. Now, this is from a review from uh, Akiko Iwasaki, which suggested that early in disease, we have, if you have mild disease and you have a low viral load, and all of this is broadly correct, that you have an interferon response that is protective and in high viral dose in uh, load in older hosts in severe disease, you actually don't have, you have this high viral load, but you don't have a good interferon response. Now in reality, what we now know is true is that you do make some interferons, but you don't have an interferon response in severe disease. So for more recent work, which has come out from Ivan Zanoni's lab, if you look at severe disease, you can make type one interferons, but there's no response to them, okay? That's, you're, you're prevented from making a response. And this is work from uh, uh, Jose Ordova's Montañez and Alex Shalek uh, showing similarly in a different way that in epithelial cells in the nose, uh, you actually have a defective response in severe disease. So you don't make uh, interferon response, even though you might have interferons being made in severe disease. And the type of interferons you tend to make in severe disease are made by epithelial cells and they're called type three interferons. So now if you think about mild disease, in mild disease, we make enough interferons, both type one and type three. And because only the infected cells might be prevented from making a, a type one response, all the other cells are being bathed in type one interferons, some made by epithelial cells, some made by plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And with a small viral inoculum and a relatively low burden of the virus, we get enough type one interferon synthesis enough of an antiviral state created and we clear the virus. And we call this mild disease and sometimes it might be asymptomatic disease and it's not a big deal. And this is normal in every infectious disease, there's mild disease, asymptomatic disease and severe disease. Yeah. Now, what is triggering this innate uh, immune response? Just to emphasize that in this virus, we have both PAMPs being, uh, being released, which are you know, viral products which are gonna activate innate immunity but we also have the generation of dams from the damage of tissues. 
So it is the PAMPs and the DAMs which are going to drive inflammation. And the biggest PAMP, of course, is the viral RNA itself, which instead of creating a lot of, you know, the antiviral state is actually driving inflammation here, but still a PAMP. The spike protein is important for some aspects of innate immunity being induced, and then DAMPs from death and damage are going to drive innate immunity. So as the virus gets in and cells die, we're going to have more activation of innate immunity in severe disease. So why do some people get severe disease? So we do know that people who get severe disease tend to be more obese, they have type 1 diabetes, they are older, often males. What is it that drives all this? So what we do understand, and this is some fairly interesting work which is holding up from further studies, is that in about four or five percent of patients with severe disease, but not in mild disease, patients have errors. They have hypomorphic mutants that affect the type 1 interferon pathway. So a bunch of genes that are part of the type 1 interferon pathway are inherited mutants or variants, which normally don't cause too much of an issue, but which make you more susceptible to severe COVID-19. Even more common, now the numbers are about 25% and the number may go up, that 20% of 25% of people, especially older males, tend to make autoantibodies against type 1 interferon. So there's a, a different break in tolerance that is occurring with age and with pre-existing conditions. And this is very rare in people who have mild disease. It is common in people who have severe disease that they have autoantibodies against type 1 interferons. So even if you made the type 1 interferons, the autoantibodies bind to them and block them from functioning, and this makes you prone to more severe disease. So much more is being explored, but these are the strongest mechanisms we have to explain why a defect in innate immunity, either inherited or created by autoimmunity within us, pre-existing, not caused by COVID-19, pre-existing autoimmune responses, pre-existing antibodies are causing us to be more susceptible to disease. So another thing that uh, COVID-19 does is to activate a pathway called the complement pathway. So this is uh, part of innate immunity, and this is caused by the spike protein. The spike protein on the virus binds to heparin sulfate, uh, displaces an inhibitory factor called factor H, and this allows activation of complement. And when you activate complement, this is also one way in which you're going to activate clotting. You're going to, in COVID-19, we have the activation we have damage to endothelial cells. We have activation of platelets. We have activation of complement and coagulation and the tendency to form blood clots so that blood clots form in tissues. The tissues are not oxygenated. And as a result, you have damage and more damps being created. And this cycle continues and sometimes can lead to death. Okay. So broadly speaking, what are we seeing in severe COVID-19? We are seeing an imbalance we see a diminished antiviral state, but increased inflammation. We have a decrease in lymphoid cells and lymphocyte-like cells that are protective, including PDCs, but an increase in myeloid cells, the ones that are driving inflammation. We have a decrease functionally in type 1 interferons, but we have an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. We have an increase in complement activation, in netosis, in coagulation, all of these are being driven by the inflammation, and we have loss of tissue integrity, and we have organ dysfunction. So some of these specific innate immune changes can drive an impairment of adaptive immunity. So innate immunity, a defect in innate immunity, sets you up to get severe COVID-19, okay? This could be inherited, could be because of autoantibodies that occur more with age, and in people with pre-existing conditions. Once you have severe COVID-19, you also alter adaptive immunity further. So you have an adaptive response, but you alter it so that it is impaired and dysfunctional for a period of time. It is in this window when we aren't evolving our immune responses appropriately, when we aren't clearing the virus, when we are probably most susceptible for the virus in the face of suboptimal immunity to act, go through antigenic evolution, okay? So we do know that viral variants cannot occur in total immunodeficiency. You need an immune response and immune pressure 
to help create antigenic variants. And there's a very nice experiment that shows that. So now we have the system, what's going on? Let's see what's happening with the adaptive immunity. So I just want to mention, and this will come up later in the course, I'm sure as well, that during an adaptive immune response, one of the things that happens is that we go through a Darwinian process where our B cells that are making antibody, this is in a normal adaptive immune response. They go through a process where each of these cells just multiplies, these cells multiply and they mutate their antibody combining sites. So the parts of the antibody, the fingers that bind antigen, the genes for them are being mutated. And as they mutate, we test each of these cells and we select the highest affinity cells and we let them go through many rounds of this so that eventually we get high affinity cells. And at the end of the day, we're gonna make long lived plasma cells with high affinity antibodies. We also create memory during this process, but even earlier in the process, we make memory cells. Now, what we will see is that in severe COVID-19, this Darwinian process of ours is stymied in severe disease. It's stymied for a period of many months and then it eventually can recover. If you recover, this part of your immune system can recover, but by then maybe the damage is done. You're making an immune response that lacks breadth. You're making an immune response where the antibodies are not refined. They do not go through the process we call affinity maturation to make them progressively tighter and tighter binders. And as a result, we have suboptimal immunity, which puts on some pressure, but it's not enough. So you can imagine we have a foe that's evolving. Normally we evolve as well, but if our evolution is stymied, the foe is going to might, might win and might evolve to become more dangerous to us. Okay, so what we see is that in severe COVID-19, we see persistence of SARS-CoV-2. We do see clearance eventually in the lungs, but then it's slow. And then we see persistence in the gut. And this has been shown by Michelle Newsom's white lab that six months later, you can see a lot of virus in the gut. We have shown there's a loss of germinal centers. And in severe COVID-19, this is quite striking. And the loss of germinal centers correlates with this absence in affinity maturation. It's defective. And we actually don't see our antibodies evolve uh, in severe patients early in the disease. There's a failure of CD8 T cell expansion even in the lymph nodes. So we should have good CD8 responses. These are cytotoxic T cells, which should kill infected cells. But the severe innate immunity and inflammation creates a milieu that doesn't allow us to expand these CD8 T cells. And we have dysfunctional CD8 T cells. So the suboptimal immune pressure that occurs in severe acute disease is possibly the ideal substrate for viral variant generation. This is why we have some interest in looking at this more carefully. This is just to show you that normally, if you looked at a lymph node, you would see that we have beautiful germinal centers and these germinal centers that you're seeing here, there's stain in gold is a transcription factor called BCL6. Uh, these should form normally, but in severe disease, we don't see that. In severe disease, when you look carefully, you actually, and the quantity itself, there are actually very few germinal center B cells. There are T dependent B cell activation events. So T cells are activating B cells, but they are not forming germinal centers. And we understand this process much better today. Uh, one of the reasons for this happening is this uncontrolled production in the lymph node of a cytokine called TNF-alpha. And we've shown that there's a lot of this. And in mouse experiments, it's known that in a severe intracellular infection, if you, you lose germinal centers, in other severe infections, they're all intracellular infections. But if you block TNF-alpha, you can restore germinal centers. So we have many reasons to believe that this induction of high levels of TNF-alpha also induction of some other cytokines uh, is what is causing a block in germinal center development, a deviation of the T cell response in a different direction. And also this could cause dysfunction in CD8 T cell responses, okay? You can have death of activated CD8 T cells. And this is perhaps part of the broader picture where initially for many months, the CD8 response is not terrific. So from a big picture point of view, and I'm just going to sort of summarize this so we have time for questions, is if you looked at other infections, and if you looked at you know, an infection which we deal with well, we would make certain T cells, which you call T follicular helper cells, which have this transcription factor BCL6, which is also found in germinal center B cells. 
And this will drive the formation of nice germinal centers. Germinal centers will allow the evolution of a good, progressively high affinity adaptive immune response. We will make good affinity matured antibodies. These will have both breadth and they'll be able to bind uh, the antigen tightly. And then we also create a robust CD8 T cell response. And this robust CD8 T cell response kills virally infected cells. Okay? And this is what we normally want to see and which we normally do see in many infectious contexts. In severe COVID-19, we see something's gone wrong. And we think there's an evolutionary reason for what we see. So CD4 T cells are diverted to a different pathway where they're trying to create a different type of CD4 T cell, which I can answer questions about it if you're interested, but basically there's another type of CD4 T cell which can help in viral killing, which we are going towards perhaps because our CD8s are not doing their job well. And there is another reason to think why are our CD8s not doing their job well? We have evolved not to lose organs. The moment we get severe infections, there's a risk of our CD8 T cells killing so many infected cells in an organ that maybe we will lose our lung completely. So we have dampened down that CD8 response that's part of this evolutionary process. The virus is being cleared more slowly. It has both pluses and minuses to it. We don't die immediately, but our T cells get diverted to make different types of T cells. We lose the T cells and make germinal centers. So now we make lower affinity antibodies. And that because of the changes in cytokines, our CD8 response is also not great. And so overall, the immune response, the adaptive immune response in severe inflammatory conditions caused by intracellular infections, including COVID-19, is suboptimal. And it is this suboptimal immune response which in an infection like COVID-19 might be causing this deep underbelly of viral variants to emerge. And this is why we should worry about uh, the disease, about worry about more people getting immunity from severe infection rather by vaccination. So vaccination is gonna control infection rapidly if you are infected. Whereas in, if you get severe immunity, true, you will eventually get an immune response. Eventually if you survive, you may be protected for at least for some years, but you may have generated more viral variants, which is a danger. So again, the final big picture view, Early infection is not controlled in severe COVID-19. There are many mechanisms that the virus employs to trick our innate immune systems. So we have, you know, virus caps, it's RNAs. It's as the two prime O methyl group uh, on the first ribose. Uh, it also sequesters RNA for replication. It does many different things to prevent us from having the best innate immune response that protects us. As a result, instead of a good antiviral state, we are left with a severe inflammatory response. We still have PAMPs and DAMPs. And this severe Im inflammatory response alters immune activation in draining lymph nodes. So our thoracic lymph nodes are where the immune response is happening in severe disease. And this altered immune response alters adaptive immunity. We have lymphopenia, so we have reduced numbers of T cells and B cells. You have dysfunctional CD8 T cells. They are not doing their job. And you can say, oh, yeah, we don't want them to do too good a job because you'll wipe the lung out and you'll die faster, but it still allows the virus to persist. It's part of the evolutionary process here. Our germinal centers collapse as a result of deviations in the adaptive immune response. All of these may have evolved for good reasons, but in certain contexts, they're causing other problems. We then have activation, more immune activation in the lung, or in any other damaged tissue, more tissue injury. And as a result, we can either, you know, with good treatments, perhaps survive, which is happening more and more today, or we might succumb. And that's one of the things that even today, there is a mortality and the mortality is tending, tending to happen more in people who were not vaccinated, who did not have any pre-existing immunity and in whom this entire cycle of going through severe inflammation and then basically altering adaptive immunity, allowing inflammation to persist, uh, goes on and can eventually lead to death. Okay, uh, I have to acknowledge the work of many colleagues, uh, many people in my lab, many people in other labs, 
many contributors of the Reagan Institute. So a lot of the stuff is from Naoki Kaneko, Shashwan Ko, Julie Boko, Jocelyn Farmer, big collaboration with Bobby Vitera. I've quoted the work of many other people and I haven't been able to quote all in the short time. There are numerous other key contributors at the Reagan, uh, including uh, Shu Yu, Daniel Lingwood, Aaron Schmidt, Bruce Walker, Matthias Lichterfeld, Vinay Marjan, Corey Perugino, Katie, and Tom Stephen Beck. And I did use BioRender to make my slides, and I'm happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing. Shiv, thank you so much. Um, we've got a number of questions for you. You described a remarkable range of, um, of viral proteins that are able to help the virus evade our innate immune defenses. Could you say a little bit about how unique this coronavirus is in accomplishing this? Or to what extent do other viruses also play these games? So uh, one of the, a broad definition, I think that's useful for students to think of, is that a pathogen has evolved to evade innate immunity. What makes something a pathogen is that it has evolved along the way to have ways to evade innate immunity. If it did not do that, it would actually not be a pathogen. Okay? It's, it would be something that we would then call a commensal in a person with normal immunity. So uh, in first thing you, we want to remember about coronaviruses, intrinsically speaking, they do not have terrible mutation rates, right? The, the proofreading functions in this virus are actually pretty good given uh, compared to other RNA viruses. So unlike flu, even flu, which mutates more, this virus actually has pretty good proofreading, okay? In spite of that, it had to evolve many genes that would allow it to su survive in the host. If it did not evade uh, the antiviral state, there would be no viral replication and we would have this virus would actually die out. So it's just an evolutionary game that every pathogen, if it wants to go from one human to another, must evolve a way to survive within us. If it is not in the lumen of the gut or somewhere innocuous, and it has to get into a cell like a virus, then it has to evolve some mechanism. So if you think of every virus, they have mechanisms. If you think of severe viruses like Ebola, or you think of uh, SARS-CoV-2, they have more pernicious mechanisms. Okay, and so this is what is causing the problem where uh, we don't, don't respond well for many reasons. Then, you know, the virologists have come up with wonderful molecular mechanisms for many of these things, which involve evading the innate immune system and sometimes evading adaptive immunity as well. This is not very different from a tumor, which evolves these things differently, right? So a pathogen, a lot of its genome has evolved to evade the immune system. It is not just about replication, it's about evasion. It's, it's still so striking how this virus can attack and disrupt so many cellular functions. And it makes us curious, is this because of its lack of coevolution with humans? Why, for example, do other mammals like bats have such a different response to this virus? Um, if, if you wanted to live in peace with the virus, you would evolve mechanisms that would prevent you from having this inflammatory response, which we did not evolve. We need inflammation for many other things. So you can say, you know, the bat is perfect for keeping this virus going. There are probably other viruses that, you know, can basically cause problems or bats, but not these coronaviruses. So that's why they've become this great, uh, you know, reservoir uh, for the world. Uh, that is probably, you know, it's, again, it's an evolutionary game. I can't give you a, anything but a hand-waving explanation for how this happens in the world, but it is an accident for us that it is this guy that seems to come and cause problems for us. Uh, but every pathogen that causes severe disease has some aspects of this phenomenon. And as we develop adaptive immunity in the population, this is not going to be as bad, right? Even if suppose there was no vaccine, all of us are the descendants of survivors. As human beings, we are descendants of survivors. If there was no vaccine, uh, we would eventually have survivors who had a mild immune response and they would procreate and then the whole world would be filled with people who maybe have no genetic susceptibilities and are better protected. That is possible. 
But you know, now unfortunately for us, we have vaccination and maybe more of our species will not be culled out by this virus. And uh, we have antibodies being generated. So it'll become milder. It'll become something that's not so bad. One of the students is interested in how you think about this balance of power with inflammation. You know, to what extent is inflammation a good thing and where, where is that a good thing? And to what extent does it become a bad thing? So what we call inflammation is basically redness, swelling, pain, and warmth, right? This is the original description of inflammation. It is a stereotypic response of innate immunity and sometimes aided by adaptive immunity to deal with pathogens, typically pathogens. I mean, you can twist your ankle and also have inflammation and that's, that's damps, but it is a protective response. Every time you brush your teeth, you create a minor version of inflammation to get rid of the bacteria that crossed into your mouth. Every time you eat and something abrades your mucosa, you create a small version of inflammation and clear it. Sometimes when something is more severe, uh, you, you know, something penetrated your skin and more bacteria multiplied, you create a more severe inflammation and you clear it. I mean, if you have a pet, you know that the pet gets injured and never gets a drug and it deals with it, okay? And this is how we all dealt with things for thousands of years before antibiotics. So yes, without inflammation, we would not be protected against the bacterial world. We would not be protected against most fungal infections, uh, against viruses, Inflammation only plays a small role in helping drive a better you know, T cell response. It is not the main driver of protection. It is a, a sideshow there, okay? So uh, that's how you should think about it. Inflammation, we need it. It is protective. Everything that is protective, it's a two-edged sword, can one day also, when out of control and dysregulated, can be damaging. It's been reported that asymptomatic individuals can have viral loads that in some cases are similar to those with individuals with disease. Do you understand how this can be? So I think, so asymptomatic is a very hard definition because sometimes it's a subjective view of somebody who doesn't feel something or doesn't, you know, report something. It doesn't, is not bothered by something. So it's a very broad group there. But I think we should think of asymptomatic individuals as being similar to those with mild disease. So those who have very few symptoms, who report them as symptoms, and they would probably have similar viral loads. Just that the asymptomatic guy cleared it and didn't bother that person and is fine. And the person who felt something, and maybe there was slightly more virus, maybe there was slightly more susceptibility, we don't know that. It's not been ever elucidated at that level. So the comparisons between asymptomatic and mild are not clear in the literature. And students often ask that question. The comparison between mild and severe, or mild, moderate, and severe, and severe who die are pretty good because they're the very defined groups. So in, Ace and Manny is kind of a bit of a shaky group. It's a lot of people, but. Yeah, related to that, as I recall, there are receptors in the brain for cytokines. Is part of the reason you feel bad this uh, ability to understand the cytokines in your brain? Yeah, so I do think that, that so a lot of things do happen in the brain, and the brain actually has much more of an immune system than we have all realized. I mean, people have more recently shown us, you know, the intimate uh, immune system is kind of a bone marrow in the skull, which is being tolerized by brain antigens. This is a recent paper from Marco Colonna. So there's a lot of more information about immune response in the brain. So there is immunity in the brain. There are cells in the brain that respond to cytokines. And yes, if you have too many cytokines floating around in the blood, there's no question that some will cross the blood-brain barrier in those individuals who present with these issues. Now, why exactly this happens in long COVID is not very well understood, okay? This is the main concern. It's not that when you're, your, when you're sick, I mean, we evolved things like fever and brain fog, uh, probably to ca cause predators to actually take rest. I mean, the fever was a good thing for us. You know, you want to rest rather than go chasing down some animal in the jungle. That was the reason to evolve fever and some degree of brain fog, maybe. Uh, I'm just trying to find an evolutionary example for it. Now that's gonna happen. You got severe disease, you're gonna have it. You get severe malaria, you'll have, your brain will be clouded. 
you have severe COVID, your brain will be clouded. That's not a problem. It's this persistence in long COVID, which is what's bothering people today that we don't understand at all. So yes, of course, there's cytokine responses and you know, they will happen. You mentioned uh, the features of a suboptimal immune response in severe COVID. Are there other viruses that um, induce such a thing? You know, why, why, for example, you described the interferon associated mutations that have become evident with COVID. Why have they not been more evident with, say, the flu virus? So, uh, well, let me just tell you what we know, right? So, Jean Laurent Casanova, who's done most of these studies, he's really the person who says that every infectious disease is a genetic disease. And now, of course, he's broadening into having autoantibodies as well, right? He has shown, his lab has shown that in people who get yellow fever vaccination, okay, which is, it's a live viral vaccine. And there's a subset of people who respond badly to yellow fever vaccination. Uh, they, they, instead of having just a normal vaccination, vaccine response, they actually get infection and severe disease and so on uh, by the vaccination. And they didn't have an obvious auto, uh, immunodeficiency to begin with they often have now these autoantibodies against uh, type 1 interferons, and they also have uh, these sometimes have genetic mutations. This is what he's shown in the last year. So I think more examples will come through. Okay, it's, it's, it's uh, no infectious disease has been studied at this intensity as we have studied COVID-19. So when we have cohorts of a few patients with Ebola and all, the studies are limited. So I think we haven't come up with the numbers in other diseases to actually elucidate some of these issues. And I think they will, this will not be unique to COVID-19. That's a very interesting point. You're saying that many of the things that we've observed, given the impact of this pandemic, uh, many of the things we've observed about this virus may in fact emerge as features of other viral infections. We just haven't studied those other viral infections to this degree. Well, you just think about in COVID when someone does a study and has 3,000 people with severe disease being compared in the same time window as uh, 2,000 people with mild disease. Well, you cannot do that in Ebola and you cannot come up with statistical numbers. Now, I actually think some of the phenomena we see are seen in Ebola. I actually have talked to somebody who's an expert in the field who uh, Fakundo knows well, is Rafi Ahmed, who, I mean, also agrees that maybe some of these things are happening in Ebola, but how can you get a study done with enough people? It's tough. Shiv, it's a uh, real pleasure to hear about this very complex subject of innate immunity and acquired immunity. Uh, thank you so much for doing this today. Of course, my pleasure.